how'd you first get into networking? Oh, geez, that's a that's an interesting story. So I um, I went to school in Michigan. Mm -hmm. That's where I grew up, and I played hockey. Um, I was in travel teams and high school team, and I and I also played later on for Michigan State University. Oh, cool. But when I was uh, 16, I was always into electronics, and I was very close to my guidance counselor at school. Mm -hmm. And the beginning of my, actually, I think it was, he contacted me before my first day of my junior year of high school. And he told me, he said, Seth, I got this opportunity for a co-op program I think you'd be perfect for. And so we got to talking, and it actually was with the state of Michigan as a computer technician to start. And um, so I went on an interview, and shortly after I started, probably the second week of my junior year, I actually would go to school for three hours, and then I would go to the state of Michigan on a co-op program, and I would work the rest of the day. Well, that's a better and way I to spend high school my... days. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Absolutely. So I spent my junior and senior years of high school going to school for three hours, and then I would go... Uh, work, I would get paid, but I'd also get graded for it um, as a com computer and slash network technician for the state of Michigan. So that really was the start of my career um, in this industry. And I kept that position um, in college as well. And then when I was done, I moved to electronic data systems, um, uh, Ross Perot's old company, and just went from there. So I started when I was 16. Wow. Did you ever get to meet Ross? I'm just kidding. Uh, well, you know, actually, it was after he had sold it to General Motors. Oh, okay. So EDS, when I was working there, was actually owned primarily by General Motors. Okay. Um, yeah, then they went private again, and now they're actually, they were bought out by Hewlett Packard. But, um, yeah, so uh, it, it's disappointing because I've heard a lot of schools, including my old school that I went to, dropped their co-op programs. And... Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but I was very disappointed because it was really the start of my career, uh, having the opportunity to do something like that. Yeah, it sounds like something great for students, not just in technology, but certainly these days in technology, um, just to give them something Absolutely. to do and get them something to work with. What, yeah. what did you learn through that program about yourself? Well, I, I went to... Yeah, I went to work and I was an employee, so I was thrown right into the fire from the very get-go yeah. um, as far as learning about not only troubleshooting, you know, probably the first six months or so, um, I, may, I mainly worked on hardware and software of desktop computers back mm -hmm. in the day, okay. um, but I, I immediately showed an interest in networking. So I spent a lot of my time working with the network administrators and engineers uh, at that time, and I quickly moved more and more into roles of being able to assist on network uh, configuration engineering and troubleshooting. Okay. <clears throat> so what, um, I mean, over the years, I'm assuming you've continued that training and picked up some certifications and, and whatnot. I'm going to ask sure. you a question. This is something that I've heard a little bit. We go back and forth with um, with some stories. Certification's good. Certification doesn't really mean anything these days. What, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, for me, especially at the time, certifications were, were vital for me. Mm -hmm. um, this was back in the mid-90s when I was in high school and then going into college. And um, when... By the time I started taking college courses for, I went for telecommunications, um, and I did a bunch of like computer science stuff too, but uh, the stuff that they were teaching, a lot of it was so outdated, hmm. and a lot of it was stuff that I was already doing, things that have progressed beyond what they were already teaching, so I had a hard time with my college class, not as far as grades, but as far as being interested. <laughs> because I had been, I had already been doing the work for a couple of years by the time I got to college, yeah. and like I said, most of the things that they were teaching were outdated, and not even true at that point. And I used to offline get into uh, debates with my instructors about how things were changing, 
uh, and, and really not understanding the relativity of the stuff that they were teaching. So that was interesting. But So the reason I bring that up is because certifications quickly at that time became a way for me to stay interested and also prove my abilities as far as the industry was concerned. So um, I spent probably the first 10 years of my career doing a lot of certifications. Mm -hmm. um, some of the some of the higher ones were uh, three different uh, MCSEs, which is the Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer. Yeah. Yep. Um, I did three versions of that, and then I also I've been working with Cisco Gear since I was about probably twenty, so twenty twenty one twenty two years. Wow. Uh, I've been working with Cisco Gear, and their certifications have always been kind of an industry standard as far as proof of knowledge and networking. Mm -hmm. So I went as high as a, a CCNP, okay. and um, I had plans to, to take the CCIE, but the way that my career went, I just uh, decided not to to go that route. But probably the first 10 years of my, um, my professional life, I did a lot of certifications. And it's interesting how you say that, how things were changing so much. I, I... But every single person you talk to today would probably say the same thing now. It's all in the um, <clears throat> midst of a big evolution for networking. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, certifications mean something different to me today than they did back then, um, mainly because of, like I said, the time frame. I was, when I got into this industry, there was some change going on. Mm -hmm. And, um, like I said, for me to keep interest, certifications were vital for me and also be able to prove that I could do, you know, get me in the door to talk to people that I could do the type of work that was relevant to the industry at that time. Right. Um, whereas the college courses were kind of useless to me at the time, to be honest <laughs> with you. I hate to say that. But it just was the, it was just the way that it was at the time. <clears throat> okay. Well, what do you like most about your job and networking in general? Things have changed so much in the last 10 years. Well, I'm, I'm definitely an, an engineer at heart. So I like, uh, I enjoy building solutions. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's one of my favorite things to do is, is take a complex scenario and engineer a solution that may be complex but simple to manage, if that makes sense. So... I feel like there are, there are a lot of guys in the industry that understand the technology mm -hmm. and can build solutions. But for me, the, the challenge for me is constantly building a solution that I don't, not only meets the needs of the solution, but also is somewhat simple to manage. Um, for me, technology, I think the goal of technology is to make you know, even in our personal life, is to make our personal lives a little more convenient and simpler to manage. Yeah. Um, I believe it's the same when it comes to the business. Well, any, any position that I've had, I feel like my job is to make um, things better for the business, simpler to manage, more efficient. So that's always the challenge for me is to look at a scenario and come up with a solution that the business is better off for me have to have do it, having done it. So that's always the challenge for me, and I enjoy that. Okay. Tell me about a, a project recently that you're proud of or that met these things that you're telling me about. Yeah, I would say, you know, probably the most applicable right now is the, the redesign of the data center mm -hmm. for Durham County, where I work. Yep. Um, I, I was in the opportunity when I started here. I've been here uh, about two and a half years. And I was given the opportunity to um, redesign the data center network infrastructure from ground up. They were at the at the point where it was due for a life cycle re replacement. Okay. And I was given the opportunity to say, okay, where starting from this point forward, how do we want to redesign and carry the D Durham County into the future? So. I, uh, I selected a software-defined solution with Cisco with uh, their ACI product. Yep. And I uh, designed and implemented. It's been up and running in production for about a year and a half now. Um, the the data center for Durham County that we've continued to build upon that is continually continuing 
to make uh, the management of the uh, network at Durham County much more efficient, including automation and a central point of orchestration. So that software so, um, defined um, that SDN environment. What um, what were some of the challenges you faced trying to migrate everything into this new environment, and um, how did it work for you? Uh, there's there's a few things. First of all, with any SDN solution, especially at the time I was doing it, it was it was so new, right? Yeah. You know, so many people had had heard the acronym had heard, maybe read some stories about what software-defined networking was, but we're having a hard time grasping how to manage a network in that environment. You know, we've done things the same way for 30-some years um, with the way that we manage data centers and networks in general, where this, this brought to the table a brand new way of doing things. Not only was, the, was some of the networking components vastly different, but the terminology. The terminology was vastly different as well. So one of the biggest challenges was educating myself and those around me on how this was, not only how were we going to implement this solution, but how it was going to make Durham County better. You know, how, what, what, type of, what type of solutions was this going to provide for us that were going to be game changers for us? Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a challenge. And then I think for the migration, one of the biggest challenges was just getting everybody on board. Um, we have we have different teams here that are kind of siloed off, yeah. and this new data center platform required all of us to kind of get on board and adopt it. So it had to break down those walls and those barriers between the different departments, so that we could all build a uh, the best the best platform possible for Durham County that would benefit not only the team that I work on, but also those around us as well, because this wasn't just for us, this was for all the teams associated with IT. What, and what does it mean to be application-centric? What, what is this new way of doing things that you're telling me about? Yeah, the, uh, application-centric really is, in the network world, we've just cared about, okay, can this, this network talk to this network? Mm -hmm. What ports need to be open? How do we secure it? Okay, great, we can all talk to each other. But as far as having visibility into the applications that are running on the network, it's always been very limited without additional um, software services that run against that, that network. And then we could, we could gain visibility. With, with an application-centric model, we'll, we're able to take a step back and not worry so much about network requirements, but worry about application requirements. Okay. And that is a big change from a network engineer perspective. Huh. I guess it's more, it's, so, that puts the business needs front and center more likely than the, Exactly, yeah. exactly. So we're able to, on top of that fabric, group our endpoints and our servers into application needs rather than network needs. Mm -hmm. So we've always been very specific on routing within the network. Okay, this application can talk to this application because the network says that it can, or this network can talk to this network because we have a rule that says that it can. Now we're able to group services, servers, applications together in a way that makes sense, where we don't really care about what network they're associated with, what VLAN they're associated with. We just group them together. And then, like, the great thing about ACI is then we can, all, we can monitor that application health itself from within um, from within the main console in ACI, so that we can see exactly what's going on with that specific application at any given time. Oh, okay, and then it, you give it the resources that it needs or it doesn't need. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So what is it? Yeah. So that's interesting because we haven't seen a lot of users of Cisco ACI. They've kind of been trying to build their their use case for the last year or so. So. Um, what makes yeah, I find I, I've been working a lot with Cisco. I've done. Um, I just recently did a webinar that had about um, had over a hundred people that ended up uh, joining in, and it, it mainly it was geared all around ACI and um, my uh, the approach that I took to it, mm -hmm. the use cases, the benefits, things like that. And we've also done some videos and things like that with Cisco. What I find whenever I talk to any other 
any other engineers, any other peers, is there seems to be still a lot of fear associated with going to a solution like this. And from from my talks with people, it goes back to, well, we've always done things the same way, right? We're, we're, we know how to get into, um, we know how to, how to get into a, a, an SSH session or a console session on a switch. We know how to program them. We know the language very well. Uh, we can script things against them to kind of automate things. It's very predictable and it's very comfortable. Well, a solution like this kind of blows that up. <laughs> And there's, there tends to be a lot of fear with people. Well, I don't really know what to expect now, right? I really don't. How do I configure this stuff? How do I troubleshoot the network at this point now that you're giving me a different interface to do things in? So um, I, I find that a lot of people don't really even start looking at it unless they have a life cycle replacement. Mm-hmm. Um, that might that might initiate, okay, let's take a step look at what the future of our data center needs to look like. And whenever I talk to people like that, I just really encourage them to don't, don't even think about it. You know, get, gather the knowledge. But my recommendation is this is the future. This is where everything is going. This is where Cisco in general and, and other vendors are putting all of their um, resources into development is this technology. So um, it, 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 I try to alleviate the fear from other people in Cisco ACI and other software-defined solutions. Um, because once you're able to get over that fear and become open to it, I feel like it becomes very simple uh, to understand as long as you stick with it. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of... I, I, it's almost like they don't... The network engineers are afraid to give up some control to the network itself to let it do its own thing, <laughs> let it automate. <laughs> yeah, so that's funny. Some people are scared, too, that, you know, wow, if I start automating all these processes or it becomes too easy to manage, then I'm working myself out of a job. That's not the, that's not the case. That's not the case. What I tell people is, okay, I, I'll start giving them examples of maybe some daily requests that they get, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, do you like doing this stuff all the time? Well, no. I'm like, wouldn't you rather spend your time working, you know, being more innovative on on other solutions that that you can, you know, kind of spend more time on? Well, yeah. I'm like, well, this 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 type of technology, this type of solution, will gives you the opportunity to automate some of those day to day menial tasks, or maybe put them in the hands of other people, so that you can, so that I know I can spend my time on things that I'd rather work on. Yeah, that does sound way more fun. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we're going to come back to a sort of related question to that, but before, before I do that, um, building on what you're talking about, this is the future. What are, um, some projects, you know, you're tackling currently or or where do you see this helping to shape, uh, the next part of your job? Well, it's, it's funny. Yeah. So right now I'm embarking on a similar, similar solution outside of the data center in our enterprise network. Uh So, um, I'm building right now the foundation for, um, have, you, have you ever heard of Cisco's DNA Center? Yeah, that's, I've come across the name. I don't know too much about it. Yeah, so Cisco's DNA Center, you may have seen commercials about network intuitive or heard that word or in, intent-based networking. Oh, yes. We've which is another, of, yes, we've done a couple Yeah, which is another big acronym going on right now. Yeah. I get so sick of these acronyms, <laughs> but... <laughs> Because every every salesperson wants to wants to write about them and and things like that, but the the basics of it of Cisco's intent based networking all revolves around what's called their DNA center. DNA center is going to be the software defined controller for the enterprise network. So it's taking that same type of model in the data center and now bringing it out to the enterprise. Here's what I here's what I talk to people about. Um, you know, a data center in general for an organization like Durham County, mm-hmm. for the most part, once it's up and running, once it's configured, once things are stabilized, on a day-to-day basis, there aren't a lot of changes that go on. You know, yeah. as long as things are running okay, yeah. there's not a lot of changes that happen on a daily basis. I don't get a lot of requests for the data center. Okay. On the the majority of the work... The majority of the work is out in the enterprise. You know, we have we have 50 sites with a bunch of switches and a bunch of routers, 
and different pieces of gear out there, wireless controllers all over the place. When we have issues or we have requests, more often they're not, they're at the enterprise level, not in the data center. So DNA center is going to be that central point of automation and orchestration for the enterprise. Okay. So that's currently what I'm working on right now. And with Cisco Solution, DNA Center has hooks directly into ACI. So what I'm going to be able to do is have policy that from a user's laptop, desktop, whatever they may be using, once they connect into the network, they'll have a policy associated for them for their user ID and or the device that they're connecting with that will carry through the enterprise and into the data center. Hmm. Not only that, but I'll be able to manage all of the network elements, all the network devices from a single point of orchestration rather than from device, 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 site by site by site. So again, it, it gives us that ability to have a more holistic view of the enterprise network rather than thinking of a bunch of switches and a bunch of routers and a bunch of sites. So it's a, it offers a big advantage for an organization like Durham County because we don't have a huge staff. There's only there's four of us in my department that manage this, this entire network. Wow. One of them is the manager who doesn't do any of the technical work. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the goal of all of this is to is to take out as much of the complexity as we can and um, add a bunch of efficiencies to how we were able to manage this network on a day-to-day -day basis. Sounds like a, quite the project. When are you hoping that's going to be done or, or next step? Well, I, I hope to have the initial pieces of it up. I'm working on some of the cornerstone pieces right now, mm -hmm. one being Cisco ICE. And also, I actually just got Cisco Stealthwatch online not, uh, last week. And D the DNA Center, which is the actual SDN controller, mm -hmm. um, probably February sometime. I'm hoping to have that online. And then we can start adding all of our devices to it and start building our policies. Okay. Okay. So it's coming up. <laughs> yeah, it's coming up, definitely, definitely. You talked about, so was that a security component I heard you mention? Cisco. Uh, which piece? Oh, I'm sorry. You just said it and it's gone. There was Stealth Watch? Stealth Watch. Thank you. That's it. Is that? Uh, the yes. Same? Yep. Stealth Watch is a, um, analyzes the behavior of users and devices on, on our network. Okay. So uh, it's, it's an amazing product and it has... The, the reason why we decided to go with it, a lot of people that are doing DNA Center, um, are, Cisco ICE is a requirement for DNA Center, mm -hmm. um, but Cisco Stealth Watch is not. I think you're missing a major component if you don't, go, or to me, a vital important uh, component with Stealth Watch because Stealth Watch becomes the enforcement piece. So Stealth Watch analyzes the behavior of every device and every user on the network. And if it recognizes any anomalies, it can quarantine those users. So right, right now, it would it would just uh, it just reports to us right now. Hey, this this looks out of the ordinary. You may want to check into it. Here's what I'm seeing. So we'll quickly point out those anomalies to us. We can take a deeper look and figure out if it's an act actually an issue or not that we need to be concerned about. In the DNA center world, what we can do is we can use Stealth Watch to identify those behaviors. And if it's something that is a known behavior that we, that we need to be concerned about, mm -hmm. we can have Stealth Watch make a call basically to DNA Center and say, hey, this is a problem, and you told me if this is an issue, you want this user or device quarantined. We can automate that process based on our policies to if, there are, if there's malware, malware detected on a, a device in our network, ransomware, any type of virus, we can automatically, without even having to do anything manually, mm -hmm. quarantine that device, have it report to us so that we can now report it to the uh, proper group to have that system remediated. Okay, yeah, I was, I was so curious. So it's this whole automated process that's going to just, it's going to make us look like rock stars, to be honest with you. <laughs> And that's it the whole like point, man. I want to be a rock star. <laughs> Absolutely, the rock star. The uh, the um, 
Tyler, of, Stephen Tyler of networking. <laughs> that's true. Right. I don't know. He's a little old. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You're right. <laughs> I was just, I was just reading a story about him actually, and how he got into some sort of altercation with somebody, and but he didn't get, he didn't he didn't get into an altercation. He like put them in their place, and he was really nice and polite about it. Uh, it's just it was oh, like recently. Yeah, recently. It was a very interesting story. Oh, okay. Um, gotcha, gotcha. I think that's why his name popped up. So, but I was, I well, was when interested. you get off the, when you get off the drugs, you're able to handle <laughs> conflict a little, a little better. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's true. When you don't look, when you don't do drugs, maybe you won't look like Steven Tyler either. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, the other thing uh, I think that's important to to mention too is upgrading com- components across the enterprise is a very time consuming process yeah. and very hard to keep up with especially when you have a small group like us the other thing that dna center allows us to do is have a single point where we can upgrade all of our devices in the network with a couple clicks okay that is a that's a big time saver for us it also gives us the ability to stay ahead of the curve when it comes to security updates from Cisco. Yep, okay. Yeah, so it's basically you have all these policies in place and the network almost helps you know when it's time to, which ones you have to, to upgrade and which ones are... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can just push them out. The, yeah. the process right now for upgrading, say, a switch, a mm-hmm. Cisco switch, it's time-consuming. It's a pain in the butt, especially when you have a site and you have, say, 20 switches at it or maybe 40 switches at it, and you got to do them all one by one. Oh, my God. It's a pain. Yeah. It's a pain. Well, this way we can push out that new version of code directly from DNA Center, and we're done. I was interested so, in the stealth watch. I just did a story about... Um, security on software defined networking and um a lot of the people are saying that 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 security component isn't really built into many of these sdn products but it sounds like it, no, I mean, it's not. St- yeah and stealth watch is not built into what you're doing but it's a good add-on so it's, it's just interesting it, it is it, it becomes it becomes the enforcer yeah of the software defined world, yeah. which which to me is it's, it's important because I not only want to be able to automate network policy, I want to automate security as much as I can sure. because we don't have time to be looking through logs or be looking through other products to try to find security breaches. Right. right. Or we don't have a SOC here. We don't have a security operations <laughs> center. So we don't have time to do that. So we need to be able to have the products that we purchase and implement help us as much as they can. And that's that's the whole point of all this. It's not just, ooh, this is a cool product. Let's play with it and let's use it. Um, no, this all has a, this all has a purpose. It all has a vision that we're trying to build here at Durham County. Great. So let's. I know we're running out of time. Let's um, shift gears slightly here. What are you doing okay. when you're not thinking about networking? Well, <laughs> I. You're always thinking I'm, about I like networking. To wor- I like to work out, so I actually get up every m- Monday through Friday. I get to the gym by 5 o'clock. Oh, my God. And uh, I get my workout in, and then I come. To, it, it, it puts me in a good state of mind. I think the way that, for me, the way that I start out my day is very important to me. Yeah. So doing something beneficial for me where I can kind of uh, set the tone for the day is always very important to me. So um, I do that every morning before work and then a little later in the day on the weekends. Um, I love to play golf. That's uh-huh. another uh, stress reliever for me. Um, I'm not as active in sports as I used to be. Um, obviously, I don't have the time for it. But I think it's important to have outlets as an engineer or anyone, really, that, that works in any type of stressful job, to have an outlet where you can disconnect. So golf is a big one for me. Uh, hiking. That um, nice. Doing stuff with my dog. I just got back from a deep sea fishing trip. Oh wow! Uh, with a bunch of with a bunch of buddies off the Outer Banks, of North Carolina. Um, so we caught a bunch of tuna, so that was a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, I'm a very active person. So anything that that gets me outside and where I can be active, I enjoy. Great. What advice would you give to younger networking professionals just starting out? Younger ones, I would say don't don't sell yourself short on on your path. For me, and I think this has benefited me throughout my career. I've never wanted to just focus on one aspect of this field. 
I've always wanted to know about the network. I want to know about the applications that run on the network. I want to know about server architecture and engineering. I want to know a little bit about software. Um, but then I also try to take that knowledge across the realm and find business needs where we can build solutions to fill those needs. So I, I, I think guys that, you know, just spend all their time working on, say, their CCIE, mm -hmm. but they don't understand anything about servers or they don't understand anything about soft uh, storage, I think they I think they limit themselves as far as um, the functions that they can perform within their company and the opportunities they can have moving forward. Um, what I have found over the years, because I've been in this field for so long, is when I first started, <clears throat> they used to staff, they used to create departments for each division of IT, and they would staff them pretty heavily, at least the, 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 the companies that I worked for. Mm -hmm. So you were able to have more focused attention on what you were doing, but the world has changed, especially with cloud and especially with um, cost not only of technology, but cost of labor. Uh, I think the more that you can fill in gaps with all things in the data center and across the enterprise, the more value that you add, not only as an employee, um, but you know, moving forward, as, as you talk to other places, uh, I find that, that most companies are looking for somebody that maybe isn't a jack of all trades, mm -hmm. but at least has some understanding across the spectrum of, of IT. And then the last thing is I would recommend is learn about your business. Learn about the, the place that you're working for. Don't don't silo yourself off and be someone who sits in a corner uh, that, that goes under the radar. You know? Yes. Start ta start talking to the leaders in your company. See what concerns them. See see what visions they have. Because you, I, I feel like you, you'll make yourself more valuable if you understand the visions of the organization as a whole. Because then you... I know for me that every solution that I'm developing, engineering, managing, I try to think of that how it how it helps that vision for the company as a whole. Yeah, you know, I hear that a lot from people these days that that's that's where they need to be focusing, and uh, maybe the more people say it, the more others will start to pay attention yeah. to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I always I always tell people uh, I did a. I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn, and I had a call to all engineers, you know, time to get behind the comfort of your, your command lines and your products and, you know, start, being, start getting a seat at the table with the, with the leaders of your organization, you know, start becoming, becoming part of the conversation. Yeah, point. <clears throat> I like that. Great. Um, I think... This is good. I'm going to take this and digest it and, and start working on it. And if I have any questions, you mind if I just send you some follow-up emails? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It'll be, it's, you know, it's going to be over the next couple of weeks I'm working on this for the next issue of the easing. So there's some time. Cool, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anytime. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate um, that. I'll be Thanks. more than happy to help you out. That's wonderful. Oh, and before I forget, um, could you send me a headshot of yourself? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Something? Yeah, we usually run that with those with these. <clears throat> gotcha. I don't have anything all great and official like no. some people, but no, that's I have fine. something that's, that'll work. No, I like that better anyway. We try, Like I said, we try to keep this more fun anyway and a little less formal. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. But, hey, all right. Picture, thanks, Gina. A picture of you with one of your tunas from the trip. That'd be cool. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I can come up with something. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Good deal. Have a great day. Thanks. It, it was great talking with you, Seth. You... Yep. Bye.